Hi everyone, good Tuesday afternoon and welcome to Go Local Live. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. Thanks for tuning in for what this show is, Politics and Prose, as we do most Tuesdays kick off with the University of Virginia Professor of Politics, Jennifer Lawless. Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. Happy to join you. Well, we missed you last week out in your West Coast swing working on a uh, a textbook uh, for academia, but now that we've got you back in the fold for some media opportunities, obviously all impeachment talk all the time. So let's go back a little bit since we had the uh, misfortune of missing you last week, but let's talk a little bit about the phone call, where things currently stand. Let's talk a little bit about that memo released by the White House for the transcript, the memo of the transcript between President Donald Trump and Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, and what was and what wasn't in that memo, and then we'll take it from there. Well, I think there are a couple of things that are worth repeating. The first is that there's no such thing as a transcript. So even though we talk about it as a transcript, what it basically is is a bunch of different people on the phone who are writing down and trying to get as close to verbatim as they can what's being said on these phone calls. And so it's there's no question that the White House at some point will start saying that this is inaccurate. But we should keep in mind that they then chose to release this. Um, and I think what the Trump administration hoped to do was what they've generally done for all of these other issues, which is to put the news out there so that they're the ones putting it forward so that it looks like nothing is wrong. Um, unfortunately for the White House, what they did was they released the records of a phone call that made it clear that Donald Trump really did, although he didn't use the words quid pro quo, offer a quid, pro, a quid pro quo for Ukrainian aid. He wanted the Ukrainian president to see what he could do about investigating Joe Biden and Joe Biden's son, Hunter Biden's um, affiliation with this Ukrainian company. And so, you know, I think that the White House assumed that this would be something that the American people wouldn't really understand or they would view it the way that they viewed the Mueller report and it just wouldn't matter that much. I don't think they were aware of the fact that the words themselves and the words that the White House put out there as accurate are an impeachable offense. Let's talk a little bit about that. As you said, the White House not anticipating that the public would think there was really a there there. Now, I'm sure you saw sort of across the spectrum, especially politically, it turned into a bit of a Rorschach test. Um, you had on one hand... Uh, Democrats, again, looking at it and saying there's clearly something there pertaining to the president's ask of the Ukrainian president. But on the other hand, you saw a number of Republicans try to say there was nothing there at all. I mean, how could people have two such wildly differing views as to what was contained in this memo? So uh, honestly, I'm looking at the news and I assess what's gone on the last few days and the last week, and I just don't know what the hell is happening. Because this is one of these examples where I don't think there's much that's up for debate or discussion. You have an actual set of things that the president said in a telephone call that the White House acknowledges the president said. The Republicans can tie themselves in knots and pretzels and in any which way they want, but the reality is that this is what was offered, and it's hard to imagine any scenario whereby they would stand there and say that if a Democratic president said this, it would not be problematic. Um, you know, this is just something that the United States government does not do. We do not investigate our political opponents. We do not certainly, as a sitting president of the United States, ask for foreign influence in figuring out how to get in, how to win the next election. I mean, the other thing that's kind of stunning to me is that if you had just gone through the Mueller investigation, if you had just sort of skated by pretty unscathed because of the Mueller report, would you really decide, okay, now from my perch as president of the United States, let me see what havoc I can wreak regarding 2020? It's craziness, and it demonstrates that this administration does not think that it's held to any standard. And basically, the Republican Congress and these Republican operatives who have been out there sort of supporting the president and the White House's position on this give them every reason to think that's the case, because there's no logic behind the partisan differences here. It really just comes down to the fact that Republicans hate Democrats, and Democrats are, you know, not so fond of Republicans. So let's talk a little bit about the whistleblower. Of course, today, President Trump tweeting that he wants to interview the whistleblower. Um, let's talk a little bit how, to, how we got to where we are. Well, first of all, there's a federal statute that says the president cannot even know who the whistleblower is, let alone interview the whistleblower. 
I don't think that the president or the White House understand that these protections are in place as a form of checks and balances and separation of powers. And they're an opportunity for the U.S. government to work and function in a way that allows justice to be provided and people to be protected when they see something within the government that is very worrisome. And the fact that Donald Trump wants to meet this whistleblower eye to eye suggests that he does not believe in these checks and balances. The fact that he thinks that Adam Schiff, who is the chair of the House, Judi uh, House Intelligence Committee, is committing treason demonstrates that he does not support separation of powers. And these are all just, I think, the latest um, examples of what has become a pretty substantial portfolio of this president not really caring that much about how our legal system operates or the rule of law. And here, an actual life is involved and a life is in danger because we've also got very, very heightened partisanship in this country and we have terrible gun laws and we have a president that's retweeting things about the Civil War and accusing people of treason. And, you know, he's the one that will ultimately have blood on his hands. Uh, let's talk a little bit. You alluded to the issue with uh, Rep. Schiff. And what the president said it boiled down to what Schiff had said during some testimony, reading what he said was a parody of uh, the phone call and not making it clear to the American public. Let's just talk about that treason aside itself. Um, was that problematic? Uh, should have been made clear? Does the president have a point? Or is, uh, obviously, is the treason argument um, perhaps a little bit far-fetched? So a few reactions. First of all, if Adam Schiff would have said nothing that was at all um, satirical, the president would still have been accusing him of treason because he doesn't think that he did anything wrong or that he should be part of this impeachment inquiry. Secondly, no, Adam Schiff's strategy is not one that I would have pursued had I been you know, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee. But in the broad scheme of things, it's not that bad. And it was pretty clear to anybody listening that it was a parody. And third, are we really going to hold all of our elected officials to the exact words that they use? Because I can count, not on one hand, maybe on one hand in a matter of an hour, how many tweets the president sends out regularly that he says are meant to be tongue in cheek or satirical or not to be taken literally. And so I just think you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say that you like psychology when it works for you and not against you. We all know what was going on. And this is just, I think, the latest political ploy that the White House is trying to push out. But, you know, I think that threatening a whistleblower is far more egregious than, you know, a pretty plausible yet parody account of what the president said on that phone call. And let's talk about former vice president, now presidential candidate Joe Biden. And of course, what we've heard and what we haven't heard from him and what we do need to hear from him as it pertains to his involvement in his son's and the Ukraine and business and political dealings there. Um, do you think what we've heard from Joe Biden to date has sufficed? Well, you know, a poll just came out today, which indicates that it seems like this could ultimately help Joe Biden. So if he is considering political calculations here, um, he might wind up speaking a little bit more about it. I think it makes sense that he was saying little for a few reasons. The first is, as far as the allegations against him were concerned, not only is there no evidence, there's actually clear evidence that he did nothing wrong, right? Now, there are ethical questions here, but that just suggests that we probably need better laws and better ethical standards and regulations on the books. As far as what is on the books, like there were no compromises, at least in terms of the vice president's role. The second thing is, I think he wants to wait and watch this White House completely uh, crumble. Right? Like, why should he get involved? Why should he dignify it with a response? Why should he defend his behavior? He should just simply say, this is craziness. Um, and the way that we're watching this unravel demonstrates that this president is willing to do anything he can to you know, quell the threat that he views as Joe Biden. Um, strategically, it's getting to the point now, because an impeachment inquiry has been opened, that it will probably behoove the vice president to you know, provide a little bit more information. The other thing that I should note is, even if Hunter Biden's activities were legal, um, you know, I think this opens a broader discussion about what kinds of standards presidents are going to hold for themselves, what kinds of standards elected officials are going to impress upon their families, what kinds of ethical um, sort of latitude we, we give to people, because it, it shouldn't have happened. Um, 
but there's a difference between it shouldn't have happened and you know the behavior that the White House engaged in. So this is that's a false equivalence. So let's talk a little bit about the process right now. Here we are. Um, Moving forward, obviously a protracted time frame looking at articles of impeachment. What are we looking at in terms of time frame? I mean, the Democrats are saying things like they would like to have this wrapped up by Thanksgiving, and I just don't see how that happens. Now, it po it's possible if it really does turn out to be that this one incident is the basis of impeachment. If that's the case, and if neither Giuliani nor Pompeo invoke executive privilege and refuse to comply with these subpoenas, then I guess if the articles of impeachment would be so narrowly constructed as to relate only to the Ukraine, it's possible that this could be signed, sealed, and delivered by Thanksgiving. My bet is that it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, it's also might it might take a little bit longer because over the course of the last week, we've seen more and more examples of what might be questionable behavior. And it seems like every time Donald Trump doubles down on the fact that he did nothing wrong, he suggests that maybe there was yet one more thing he did wrong. And let's talk about what else might uh, you know be not happening in the side of the beltway as this is taking up i mean this this is all of the oxygen in the room is it not it is however it's not like congress was getting so much done before this um, I mean, we have divided government. We have a Senate that's unwilling to do anything except Mitch McConnell does acknowledge that he will bring forward an impeachment trial should it get to the Senate. Um, I mean, we're not having important debates and deliberations about key issues. We're not, you know, holding hands and trying to figure out how to solve the nation's problems. But we have not been doing that for a very, very long time. Uh, the one thing that I think is potentially taking a hit is an ability for the American people to continue to discriminate and differentiate among the Democratic candidates for president because that all of the oxygen has sort of been sucked out of that race. Now, there's another debate coming up, and um, I think we'll see some more energy uh, you know, devoted to that. But this isn't the best time to fall off the face of the earth for any of these candidates. The other thing that I would note is Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, are now going to also be mired probably in the um, impeachment process. Uh, and that could ultimately give Joe Biden an advantage as well. He doesn't have to be, he's not only is he the focus of it, which is great for him because it demonstrates that Donald Trump thinks he's a threat, but he doesn't have to be in Washington actually asking the hard questions and making the kinds of decisions that they're going to have to do as members of the U.S. Senate. Let's talk a little bit about the role, before we let you go, of Mitt Romney. Now, obviously, he's deeply out there. Troubled. He's, I'm sorry? He's deeply troubled, he says. <laughs> um, you know, does he play a pivotal role moving forward um, in terms of where the Republican Party lies outside the realm of President Donald Trump? You know, when Mitt Romney was elected, I had high hopes for him. I thought that after Jeff Flake and Bob Corker left the Senate, Mitt Romney would basically be the conscience of the Republican Party and provide an alternative, not only because he wouldn't be up for re-election for six years, but also because it's hard to imagine any scenario by which he'd be defeated. Um, you know, he's very, very well liked in Utah. He doesn't have presidential ambitions at this point, as far as we've made clear, as he's made clear. And so he's uniquely and unusually positioned to sort of be the, um, you know, the outspoken opponent of Donald Trump. And I guess if we measure that in terms of tweets or language that suggests that he's upset and losing sleep, he scores an A on that front. But it's still Jeff Flake who is out there writing these op-eds saying, look, if you believe in um, you know, rule of law, you can't vote for Donald Trump again. It's not Mitt Romney saying that. Now, mm -hmm. he's the most well-situated to do it, and maybe over the course of the next week, as we see some more Republicans beginning to suggest that they're at least open to this inquiry, he'll become a little bit more outspoken. But, I mean, I've been holding my breath for a long time, and I feel like I'm losing air. <laughs> Anything else to watch, uh, Professor Lawless, before we have the opportunity to catch you next week? Uh, I mean, I think that the extent to which Pompeo and Giuliani either refuse or comply with the subpoenas will tell us a lot about the timeline of the investigation. I also think they'll tell us a lot about um, sort of how how well the White House is positioned to weather this storm. I mean, as of right now, Donald Trump says that he has said that he does not want to put together a team of lawyers. He does not want to put together a war room. He does not want sort of an impeachment staff. 
um, and that he thinks that Giuliani can handle most of it. If the last week was any indication, then I don't think he has any idea what's ahead of him. Um, but after this week, if they actually do comply, it might be too late for the president. If we believe what we're hearing, then you know even the people who are his biggest supporters are preparing him for the likely reality that he will be impeached, perhaps not removed from office, but certainly impeached. Well, as always, appreciate your taking the time to Skype back into your old stopping grounds up here when you're a professor at Brown. But Jennifer Lawless down at the University now of Virginia, thank you for taking the time to Skype in. See you next week. Okay, we're going to let Professor Lawless go. And as I promised, some pros, Dr. Ed Inicelli of Ed Wright's, and to talk about his latest writings and more. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back here on Go Local Live.